Well, we're looking at this term faithful today in Galatians 5, 22. We come to this part of the fruit of the Spirit where it talks about faithfulness. And uh, yet I want to share some remarks that are not in your notes just to start out because I want to make a distinction here between faith and faithfulness. Second Chronicles chapter 20 and verse 20, it says, Early in the morning they left for the desert of Tekoa. As they set out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, and he was the king, he said, Listen to me, Judah and people of Jerusalem, have faith in the Lord your God and you will be upheld. Have faith in his prophets and you will be successful. Well, when people think about faith or faithfulness, there is a distinction I think we need to make. Faith is a term that's used quite a bit in these times, and it always is. People bring it up, but it's just like all you have to do is have faith. It doesn't matter what your faith in. Uh, just so long as you put some kind of faith in someone or something, then that will be satisfactory if you are sincere in your, your belief system. And that is certainly a fallacy when people feel like that, and yet many do. Many are of the persuasion today, and they're called progressives or pluralists, and they'll say, in regards to religion and spiritual matters and moral matters, there's no absolute truth. They'll say there's no absolute truth. In fact, some would just want to make that as a blanket statement. No truth that is absolute. Well, that's just not correct. I mean, in certain areas of life, we know there's absolute truth. When you think about gravity, it doesn't matter where you live, whether it's in the United States, whether it's in China, whether it's in Russia, whether it's in Thailand, it doesn't matter what language you speak, what color you are. If you stand on top of a building and you jump off, you're coming down. I mean, that is an absolute truth. You will be coming down. Or when you think in the field of mathematics, it doesn't matter where you go in the world. Uh, this is true. Two plus two equals four. That is an absolute truth. You cannot change that. And yet some of these people want to come along and say, in the realms of morality and the realms of spirituality, well, there's no absolute truth. I mean, just whatever you're comfortable believing, whatever fits in with your lifestyle, then that's satisfactory. If you're pleased with it, then it's perfectly all right. And that's not correct, but when you get into the realm of spirituality and they talk about this faith and all faith should be embraced and accepted, and they'll say no faith has the handle on truth, no faith contains all the truth. There are semblances of truth in every religious belief and every faith, and the people of all faiths can have encounters with God. I read this week a little parable about an elephant. And it said there were blind men around an elephant. And one had a hold of the uh, tusk and thought it was a spear. And one had a hold of the leg and thought it was a tree. And one had a hold of the tail and thought it was a rope. One had a hold of the trunk, thought it was a snake. And one was just leaning against it and thought it was a wall. And they said, now here they are, these blind men, they all had different perspectives, but they were all in connection with the elephant. And they want to say religions like that. People have different perspectives about God and how you get to God. But the point is, all people, regardless of their faith, they're in contact with God. They're in some kind of relationship with God. That's just not true. Not true at all. You start breaking down religious beliefs and you can break it down in uh, different ways, but theists, they believe that God created all. Pantheists, they think God is all. God's in everything. The pew you're sitting on is God. The pulpit here is God. The tree outside is God. You're God. That's what pantheists believe. And then the atheists believe no God. No God at all. Well, then when you look further into that, and theists, Christians are theists, but so are Jews, and uh, so are Muslims. And then when you think about the pantheist, Zen Buddhist, they're into that. Hindu is into pantheism. And New Agers that we hear a lot of, they're into that kind of belief system. And then, of course, the atheists are just the people who they say, universalists could be this, where they say, well, we don't, we don't believe there's a God. Well, when you look at that, you must think, well, now, theists, if uh, Christians and Jews and uh, Muslims are theists, then they must be very similar. Well, they're not. 
They're not at all. Because on the doctrines, main teachings about God, the nature of God, and man, and salvation, and how you get to God, how you experience salvation, what salvation means about judgment, about an eternal hell, they're all different. And listen, everybody cannot be right. Just like in math, there are certain things that are right and certain things that are wrong. The same thing is true in the spiritual realm. And if you buy into this notion that just faith in anyone or anything, so long as I have faith and I'm sincere in my faith, then I'm okay. Paul the Apostle did not feel that way when he was in Athens in Acts 17 and he sees all these people and he told them, he said, I perceive that you are very religious people and you're so sincere in your belief. And they had all these gods that they worshiped. Some worship one god, some another. They even had a statue to an unknown god. And the apostle Paul didn't stand before them and say, this is really a wonderful thing what you're doing. This is a beautiful thing that you're doing. And I perceive you're sincere and you're all right with God. He didn't say that at all. He said, I know that you're very sincere and I know you're religious people, but I want to talk to you about the one true God. And he told them about the Lord of heaven and earth, told them about Jesus Christ, encouraged them to put their faith in him. He, he spoke in no uncertain terms to them. He said, God has appointed a day in which he will judge the world and he's going to judge the world through the one that he has raised from the dead. And he was encouraging them. He said, the times of ignorance God has overlooked, but now he has commanded all men everywhere to repent because this day of judgment is coming. And he's saying, God's told you to put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's the teaching of the Scripture. Uh, the Bible says, Jesus, you know, when you start trying to evaluate, well, how can I discern? Well, you do need to look at evidence. You need to evaluate evidence, and there's plenty of evidence historically about the New Testament and the Old Testament, and that would indicate the truth of this. But uh, really, it all comes down to this. I would want to look at Jesus Christ and look at other religious leaders, be eager to let you compare them to Jesus Christ. But Jesus is the only one that came and demonstrated feats that only God could perform. He proclaimed that he was God. He died on a cross, and he's the only one to conquer death. And so when it all comes down to it, I believe I want to put my life and put my belief system in the hands of the one who did that, and it's only Jesus. And the Bible underscores when we start talking about faith, that you want to invest your faith in Him and in Him alone. You don't want to trust anyone else to be your Savior, to provide for you in this life, to provide for you in the next life, to pay for your sin. Only Jesus can do that. Jesus made it abundantly clear. Jesus wasn't one of these who said any belief goes. Jesus said this, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. You will not come to the Father unless you come by me. It says in Acts 4.12, there is no other name, meaning there's no other person under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved other than the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. When the Philippian jailer came into Paul and Silas after the earthquake and the prison cells were open, he was going to kill himself. He thought all the prisoners had escaped. And Paul called out to him and said, you don't need to do that. We're all still here. And this jailer comes in. He says, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And Paul didn't get into some discussion about, well, now what's your theological belief? And if you're comfortable with that belief, then you just go with that. No, immediately he said this, you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Well, faith, when you start thinking about faith and putting your faith in Christ, faith not invested in Christ spiritually is futile. Whatever else you're trusting, it's futile. But when you put your faith and your trust and your life in the hands of the Lord Jesus and you receive him, then that's the beginning of a relationship. We start our relationship with God, and that comes when you just receive Christ. The Bible says, to as many as received him, to them gave he the right to become the children of God, even to those who believe on his name. So I'd ask you, just think in your own life. Many of you I know have already received Christ as your Savior. But now if I were just talking to you individually, have you? Have you received Christ into your life? And made that commitment where you've understood that, Jesus, I am sinful. I can't do anything about this sin. But I believe you are God. You came. You gave your life on a cross for me. You arose from the grave. And, Lord Jesus, I'm sorry for my sins. And by faith, 
I want to give my life to you. And I ask you, you alone, I'm depending on no one else. I want you to come and be my Savior. Have you made that commitment of your life? There's faith, faith in Christ. It starts a relationship. But now when you talk about faithfulness, which he mentions here in Galatians 5, 22, this fruit. Now, this is loyalty. Once you come to Christ, it's not just an initial commitment. Here, Lord Jesus, I begin this relationship with you. Faithfulness has to do with loyalty to the Lord Jesus. I want to live out things that he says. And when you start thinking about this loyalty, you can say loyalty to Christ, but if you leave it just at that, many people, they don't understand that. A lot of people think they're being loyal to the Lord Jesus just because they attend a worship service on a Sunday morning. You can do that and not be loyal to Christ. Loyalty entails much more than that. Jesus walked along, and when he'd call these different ones like Matthew and Peter and Andrew, He'd go and he'd say these two words, follow me. I want you to follow me. And when he's saying that, he's not saying, I want you to just trail along behind me. But he's letting them know, and as time went by, they began to grasp this and understand it, that what he taught, he wanted them to accept. The way he informed them how they should live, that's how he wanted them to live. And you break it down in all areas of life. All areas of life, family life. The Bible gives prescriptions, it gives advice, it gives commands about how people are conduct themselves within their family. All the rash divorces that we see today, obviously people aren't doing the things that Christ wants them to do within their family. If these things are going on, Jesus says in his word about a man and a woman being together. And he said, what God has joined together, let no man put asunder. And then the Bible gives these definite teachings, how a husband is to be, he's to love his wife, he's to not exasperate his children. The wife is to be submissive to her husband, respectful of her husband. They're together in this relationship, but they're to be loving toward her, each other. She toward him and he toward her. And then in your work life, how we're to conduct ourselves. You know, the Bible, when it talks about issues like gossiping, you think in the workplace of all the gossiping that goes on. The things that occur, the slander that takes place. That's not following Jesus. Listen, if you're doing that, that's not following Jesus. Jesus gives advice about how we're to live, how we're to respect other people, whether it's in the workplace, whether it's in our neighborhood. He said, love your neighbor as yourself. We're to have a respect for people, our friendships. The Bible gives advice about that. The philosophy of life, so many people go around and they're wringing their hands especially in times like this. And I can see how people that don't know Christ could be very discouraged in this world in which we're living today. And they could look and think it just seems to be coming apart at the seams. And we see what's happening in the Middle East. We see what's happening in our own country. We think it's just all falling apart. You could be so full of despair. That's not how Christians to be. The Bible talks about our blessed hope. Our hope is in the Lord Jesus and His return to the earth. And until he comes back, the fact that he is the sovereign Lord, no one else is. A believer should not walk around and live their life in pessimism and despair and defeatism. A believer should have a hope within their life. That's what Christ would want for us. And then truths about the Lord. The things that he says about himself, he wants you to accept that and believe. But loyalty in those ways. Now look, you will not be faithful to the Lord Jesus unless you're having this commitment. Here's this loyalty. Jesus, I understand what this means. I become a faithful follower of you. But listen, there's something else. There's the use of spiritual gifts. And we're going to talk about gifts once we finish this series on the fruit of the Spirit. But all believers have a spiritual gift, at least one. Some have more than one. And you have different talents that you use. And you have resources that the Lord's entrusted unto you. And all these things He's not given to us so that we can just sit on them. He intends for us to use them. In the parable of the talents, he gave one five, another two, another one. And the one with the five used his, the one with the two used his, the one with the one didn't do a thing with his. And Jesus said when the master comes back and he finds that one that didn't do anything, then he was not pleased in the least. And that's not representing a believer there, but the principle 
about how he wants us to use what he's entrusted in us, certainly that stands forth. And that's true for us. Well, listen, there's some people, they don't even have a clue what their spiritual gift is. They haven't researched enough in the Bible to even understand what spiritual gifts are. They're not interested in knowing their spiritual gifts. They're not interested in using their spiritual gifts. And listen, if that's true, you're not loyal to Christ. He wants us to use what he has entrusted in us. And then what about this, his calling upon our lives? He makes a calling upon us about where he'd want us to go, who he'd want us to be with. You know, I believe this. I believe if a person will seek the Lord, the Lord will direct him. If he wants him to be married, direct him to a person he wants him to be married to. And I know a lot of people don't believe that. They think, well, it's kind of a random deal out here. And maybe five, ten different ones. Just pick one of those and you'll be all right. I think the Lord leads you, if you'll let him, to a right person. I was uh, sad in this past week. I got a call from my friend in Texas, Lee Terrell, and he told me that my pastor had passed away, Dr. Brandon. And Dr. Brandon was my pastor during junior high years and high school years. Tremendous man, just a wonderful man. They had his funeral yesterday in Sherman. And his wife, Mrs. Brandon, she has been an excellent friend to me. I told the Wednesday night prayer group uh, this past week that I called her. Dr. Brandon had dementia, and I called her a few months ago just to check on them. And uh, she was telling me how it was going. But she told me then, and she didn't know how long I'd been up here. But she said, you know, I want you to know this. She said, every Saturday, I pray for you, and I've done that for 30 years. And she's just that kind of lady. And there are different people on her prayer list. But now, here, Dr. Brandon had passed away. And so it was just a sad time. But she told me a long time ago, when I was a college student, she said, when I was in college, I was engaged to a young man. And she said, he was a fine young man. And she said, here, we dated for a while, and we were engaged to be married. And she said, one day on the college campus, I saw Tom Brandon. Didn't meet him. Hadn't met him yet. I just saw him. And she said, when I saw him, and you may think this is totally weird. She said, I knew that's the guy I'm going to be married. And I inquired more of us. That seems strange to me. She said, no, I just knew, Bob. I said, I can't explain it. And she had such a close walk with Christ. She broke off the engagement. She had it worked out. She got to meet Tom Brandon. And uh, they were married. They've had five wonderful kids that are now adults and, and a great family. But in her telling me that about how God leads us, if you think that's strange, look, it says in Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, and we can quote this. I don't know how many of us just always believe it. But it says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him and He will direct your paths. He will direct you. And so that's why in that area of life, in our work, what am I to do with my life? Listen, the Lord doesn't just call people to be uh, pastors or evangelists or missionaries. No, I believe He calls people in all walks of life. You have talents and skills that He's given to you. He may want you to be an engineer. He may want you to be a dentist. He may want you to be a teacher. He may want you to be a plumber, an electrician. Listen, He may want you... Uh, in custodial work, caring for buildings. I had a principal right here in the Middale area. The gentleman's no longer a principal. He's in another business. But he said when he was a principal of school, the one he looked for first was the one who was going to take care of the buildings. He wanted someone competent who was an expert in that, who was good in that, because he said if the buildings weren't taken care of, if they were shabby and run down, it's not going to be conducive to learning. So in that line of work, whatever it might be, Loyalty to Jesus is where I come to him and say, Lord, you call me and whatever you want me to do, I'll be willing to do that with my life. Have you made that kind of surrender to him? Or to go where you want me to go? I have to admit to you, I've been a bit nervous about Allie King. She's going to go to the Middle East. And with all the trouble over there, it disturbs me a bit about her. And yet she's affirmed for me, this is where I'm supposed to be. And if that's where she needs to be, if that's where Christ is calling her then that's where she needs to go. Look what it says in Acts chapter 16. 
the Apostle Paul. And look at the mindset that he had. Acts chapter 16, in verse 6. It says, Paul and his companions traveled throughout the, the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word of, in the province of Asia. And when it came to the border of Mysia, they tried to enter Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them to. So they passed by Mysia and went down to Troas. And during the night, Paul had a vision of a man of Macedonia standing and begging him, come over to Macedonia and help us. And after Paul had seen the vision, we got ready at once to leave for Macedonia and concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. Now look, when he's trying to go in these other regions and the Spirit of God is preventing him, he's not saying, well, we're just going to go ahead and plunge on in. No, when he sensed the Lord didn't want him there, then he didn't go there. And when that call to Macedonia was extended to him, he didn't go, well, I don't know that I like that region. No, that wasn't even in his thought processes. If this is where you want me to be, then that's where I'm going to be. Now look over in Acts chapter 20. Look what it says here. Acts chapter 20, he's giving his farewell uh, speech to these elders. And it's... Uh, it's a sad time for them. Verse 22 and following. It says, And now compelled by the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, he said, I'm going to Jerusalem. I know this is what the Holy Spirit has for me. Not knowing what will happen to me there, he says, I do not know, but I know I'm supposed to go. He said, I only know that in every city, the Holy Spirit warns me that prison or hardships are facing me. And you can think, well, now, wait a second, that sounds strange. Here's the Holy Spirit telling him you're to go to Jerusalem. And then every place he stops along the way, the Holy Spirit bears witness to him. Prison and hardships are awaiting you there. And yet, look what he says, verse 24. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me if only I may finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the gospel of God's grace. But he said, whatever he wants me to do, I'm willing to do. Wherever he wants me to go, I'm willing to go. Listen, that's loyalty to Christ. That's loyalty to the Lord Jesus Christ. When you start thinking about faithfulness, faithfulness, that's what this is talking about. Faith, I enter this relationship with Jesus. Faithfulness, I'm loyal to my Savior in my day-by-day -day life. Now, the final thing I want to mention this morning is this. What's our biggest struggle with faithfulness? What is so hard about this? Galatians 5.22 underscores for us, this is a fruit of the Spirit. That means the Spirit produces it in us. Our biggest struggle is we don't understand that. Our, our biggest issue is that we think we have to somehow fire ourselves up, get motivated ourselves, and make ourselves be faithful to the Lord. And that's where we fall far short. Look, think of all the times you've been in a service, a worship service or an evangelistic service, and the minister's called you, come forward and recommit your life to Christ. You're a believer, recommit your life. And maybe you've done that. Maybe you've done that many times. I've done that. I've walked down aisles. I've gotten on my knees and in front of an altar and asked the Lord, I want to recommit myself to you. I've done that. And how many people, they do that in their life and they're, they're sincere in what they're doing. They have every intention of turning from sin and being faithful to the Lord. And yet a little time goes by and uh, they're either right back in the same old sin or they've lost interest spiritually and they're not following Christ. Now, we won't ask for any show of hands, but if we had to raise our hands, how many of us have been through that little routine? Well, I have. And I'll bet you just about every believer in this room has as well. And look, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with a recommitment of life to Christ, but here's the issue. When people come to recommit their life to Christ, if it's not explained to them how that recommitment is going to be fulfilled, that the Spirit of God is to do this in their life, then it won't last. It will not last. Well, you think, what are some of the ways that we try when we get in these situations, we try to make ourselves faithful to the Lord Jesus? Well, uh, we can do it like this. We can be uh, at a point where we shame ourselves. 
and we just put ourselves down, get all over ourselves, talk about how bad we are. We just do it to ourselves. I'm so bad. We think if I make myself feel bad enough about my sin, then I'll turn from the sin and I won't do it because it's so uncomfortable and so miserable to live in the sin. But that doesn't work. Martin Luther, the great Reformation leader, Martin Luther was going to be an attorney. And his mother and father wanted him to be an attorney. He was a brilliant young man. So that's what he was doing. But he was riding a horse and lightning struck very near to where he was, knocked him off the horse. And here's what he says. St. Anne, I'll be a monk. I mean, his life was in the hanging in the balance there. And he said, I'll be a monk. And calling on St. Anne. Well, he followed through with that. He went to a monastery. He wanted to get in there. He thought this is the way he could get his life right with God. And he went to Rome. He thought if I get in Rome where all these priests are and I share in the communion, the Eucharist with them, that it'll be special. But then he got there and he was so disillusioned because the priests showed up to that. Some of them were drunk. They were making fun of it. Martin Luther goes back in that monastery. He just tries to punish himself physically. They found him one day. All his clothes, they were off of him. He laid on the, the cell floor that night. He was just almost freezing. It was horrible. The conditions were horrible. He was in bad shape. But an old priest who did know the Lord got to him and said, Martin, the just shall live by faith and pointed him toward Christ. Martin Luther started studying the book of Romans. And as he studied that, then he began to understand that it's not through me punishing myself that I have salvation. It's by faith in Jesus Christ. Well, listen, as a believer, you don't develop loyalty to Christ's faithfulness in your life by punishing yourself, talking about how terrible you are, recounting all your sins, making yourself feel miserable. That's not how you become faithful. That doesn't work. Here's another way. We can tell ourselves this. Jesus will be sorely displeased with me if I'm not loyal to him. Jesus will be sorely displeased. Well, he he will be. But you can tell yourself that morning, noon, and night. Jesus is so upset with me. But you just running that around in your mind, that won't make you be faithful. That may make you give up some sins or bad habits for a period of time but that won't develop faithfulness in your life. Can't do it. Here's something else. If you tell yourself, well, you know, the faithful life is the great life. And it is. Being, there's nothing better, no greater quality of life than being faithful, loyal to the Lord Jesus Christ. But you can tell yourself that. It's not a, there's not a better life. This is a, the abundant life, loyalty to Christ. But if that's all you do, you just tell yourself that, that won't even produce faithfulness in you. Let me show you something else that won't either. Pouring over Scripture won't. Look what it says in John's Gospel in the fifth chapter. John chapter 5. And Jesus is dealing with some Jewish people here. And look what he says in verse 36. John chapter 5, verse 36. Jesus said this. I have testimony weightier than that of John. For the very work that the Father has given me to finish, which I am doing, testifies that the Father has sent me. And the Father who sent me has himself testified concerning me. You have never heard his voice nor seen his form, nor does his word dwell in you. Now look at that. His word does not dwell in you. For you do not believe the one he sent. You do not believe in me. But now look what he says. You diligently study the scriptures. You think, well, wait a second. If they diligently study the scriptures, then the word of God has got to be in them. And yet Jesus has just told them. He says in the, the passage right above this, he said, his word does not dwell in you. But here you are, you diligently study the scriptures and you think that by them, by you studying the scriptures, that you possess eternal life. And Jesus informs them you're so mistaken. He says the scriptures only testify about me and yet you refuse to come to me and to have life. And that certainly throws some insight on that because when he says the scriptures testify about me, 
He's letting them know, even though you study the Scriptures, you're not believing what the Scriptures have to say. You see, we can do that. You can read the Bible. Madeline Murray O'Hare, who was an atheist, she read the Bible from cover to cover. But she was an atheist. People come to the Bible, they'll read into the Bible what they want to see in the Bible. That's not how you should approach it. You should approach it like this. Let the Bible speak to you, not you bring your preconceived ideas and try to find substantiation for them in what the Scripture says, but let the Bible speak to you. And these people weren't. And they were trying to find salvation just by searching the Scriptures, but they wouldn't come to Christ and they didn't have it. Well, now, how many Christians go to Bible conferences all the time? They go to Bible studies. They, they do all these things. They listen to Christian radio constantly. Some do. And yet they're not faithful. How does that happen? It's the same thing as right here. So oftentimes we read, I'll guarantee you, there are believers who they've adopted a lifestyle morally that goes directly against what the Scripture says, yet they read the Scripture. They're just reading into it their own meaning, taking what they want to see and rejecting other parts of it. And you searching the Scripture, if you're not accepting this as God's truth and letting it speak to you, that's not going to make you faithful. That will not make you loyal to the Lord Jesus. And that may be why some believers, they've given up on Bible study because they're approaching it in the wrong way. They think it doesn't make any difference in my life. I've read the Bible and yet still I do, do these sins. That's our problem. We think we've got to make ourselves faithful. And here's what G the Bible says, and Paul underscores this in these simple little statements in Galatians. The fruit of the Spirit is faithfulness. He's saying, just like in salvation, Jesus saves you. You don't save yourself. Well, faithfulness, you don't develop that within yourself. The Holy Spirit of God is the only one who can. The fruit of the Spirit is faithfulness. So the only chance that anyone in this room, you, me, anyone, has a chance of being loyal to Christ to the degree that we need to be loyal is to begin every single day and just say, Spirit of God, you live in me. You take control today of my thoughts, my words, my attitude, my, my beliefs. You direct my life. You help me to be today all that Jesus wants me to be. And sometimes you have to pray a prayer like that several times through the day. But that's the key. The Holy Spirit produces faithfulness. You don't understand that if you don't and don't allow him to. Just know this, no matter how much you come to church, no matter how much you read the Bible, no matter whatever else you do, you will not be loyal to Jesus Christ. But I'll tell you this, if you'll just be like a little child and say to him each day, Spirit of God, here, this life is yours. Honor Jesus through me. Help me to be loyal and always to him, to my Savior. You do that, and the Spirit of God will produce this faithfulness in you. Let's bow our heads. Father, help us. This is the crucial part of our lives that we be loyal to you, Jesus, every single day. And Father, I, well, I've struggled with this. And I know, I'm sure many believers, maybe all the believers in this room have. I pray this is a simple truth. Only the Spirit can bring this degree of loyalty to our lives. And so, Lord Jesus, I pray that you'd help us not only to understand that, but, Lord Jesus, help us to yield every day to the Spirit's control of our lives. And, Father, I pray right now for any person who has not received Jesus as Savior. We pray that you'd work in their hearts, convince them of your love for them, and that you alone can save them. And, Lord Jesus, I pray they would receive you. But you, you do that work, dear Lord. And Jesus, I ask this in your name. And while our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, in just a moment we will be dismissed. But once we're dismissed, I'll be right here at the front. And if you've never invited Jesus to be your Savior and you'd like to do that, then I invite you to come forward. This is a time of invitation for you. And we'd be glad to share with you 
how you can have Christ as your Savior and your Master and begin this wonderful relationship with Him. It might be that you're a believer and uh, you're looking for a church home and you'd like to talk about membership here. Well, we'd love to talk with you. If that's true of you, you just come forward. Or it could be that the message today has been right to you. You're the believer and you, you, you're so frustrated because you want to be faithful, but you're not. And you want somebody to talk with you more about that. Well, we'll have people down here and I'll be here. We'd be glad to visit with you, pray with you, help you in any way that we can.